Finally, Lily can be free of her lupine servant and retreat to the comfort of their room. The dusty diviner is eager as well to shake off the cold and eerie feeling still hanging over her after her resurrection. Bones is just glad his mistress has decided to stop for the day. Lily goes to sit at the end of the bed, taking out the scrolls she recovered from the crepes. All right, Lily, gaining a new level. Sixth level here. I guess probably only enough skill points to increase class skills. All right, spellcraft, lore, and concentration. And I guess as usual, we'll save these for next time. All right, and a feat. And I think I talked a little bit about this, how to overcome spell resistance, it's a caster level check, which is a d20 plus caster level. Now six. There's not much else that she can do to improve that, except for these feats for spell penetration. So I think she'll take this now. Plus four bonus. It's quite a lot at this stage. All right. And two spells, third level. Although actually, I think she's going to take a second level spell. Where is it? Here it is. Continual Flame. This is actually introduced with the Shadows of Undrin Tide. So you wouldn't find a scroll of this here during the official campaign, but she'd like to sell Melden and Staff with the light. With this spell, she could create a permanent light source on something else. Then not have to worry about uh, things like that. So I think she'll take this. Otherwise, um... You know what? Maybe find traps just for now. I didn't realize it would actually disarm them as well. That's handy. Alright. Of course, bones leveling up. That's pretty good. Plus three hit points. Above average. Lily decides to memorize two new spells, including Continual Flame. Continual Flame will allow her to touch an object and imbue it with a permanent arcane flame, equivalent in brightness to a torch. It may look like a regular flame, but it creates no heat and doesn't use oxygen. It can be covered and hidden, but never smothered or quenched. Her bow will do nicely for a new arcane light. Finally, she can speak with Lanu. Hopefully this time she'll be willing to confide in her mistress. Hey there, dear. What can I do for you? All right, Lily's hoping that her and Lanu can continue their conversation from before. I appreciate that you've waited patiently to hear more of my story. I think we've gone through enough together to warrant a deeper level of trust. <laughs> After Lanu's brush with death. I just ask that you don't make fun of me since this was such a dark blot on my name. Many years ago, a cleric performed a service for the people of Everesca by uncovering a drow plot to destroy the city. Saint Umumbo came and presented the priest with a silver goblet. All right, she had mentioned that a thief had stolen something from the temple. Assuming that maybe that's what it was. Yes, the thief stole it right out of the temple and managed to sneak out of Everesca. No small accomplishment there. The other priests were frightfully mad. Only the head priest was willing to concede that it could have happened to someone else, but of course it didn't. It happened to the person that broke the head off the golden statue of Corellin. <laughs> Presumably herself. I didn't know what to do, 
So I stayed up all night, praying to Sayanin to guide my path. The goddess heard my prayer, and just before the first ray of light broke the dark, I was granted a vision. Or they they asking what this vision is, or was. I saw myself leaving Everaska and going on a long journey. At the end of the journey, I returned with the chalice. The trip itself was a blur. I had no idea where to go other than north and west. When I told the priests of my vision that would take me far away from them, they had a cheerful celebration in honor of my sacred quest. <laughs> it was the first moment in my life when I felt I truly belonged. Of course, it was going to be polite. But now they'll never welcome me back to their city. My quest has failed. He has a sneaking suspicion that it hasn't. <laughs> she found the silver chalice of Sandy Mumbo at the Melton in estate. No, you don't understand. No one will ever understand. I should be an outcast for life. Please, Lily, I should not have said so much. We'll talk more about this later, but not now. Lily's finally willing to divulge that she found what could be the very same chalice Lanou is looking for, but she can't seem to get a word in edgewise about it. Hey there, dear. What can I do for you? Alright, Lily, speaking more with Lanou. Probably taking the chalice out, trying to <laughs> show her that she might have found what she's looking for. I guess I should be glad to share my daunting task with a friend. If I cannot turn to a fellow elf to help me, then who could I turn to? Sorry, so overcome with despair, but you see, I found the silver chalice of Mubo once already. I found it in a small town called Lork, but then, oh, Lily Black, I lost it again. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering how in the realms did she do that? As I said, I found the chalice in the merchant town of Lork. The thief, a halfling, tried to sell it to a Zent merchant, but when the halfling tried to charge him 500 gold, the Zent claimed the religious artifact as a tribute to Bane. The halfling thief protested, but the mayor of the town is a Zent as well. Next thing the halfling knew, he was arrested for the murder of an old woman who had spit in the face of a Zent soldier the day before. Obviously, he never committed the crime. It never fails to shock me when people are capable of such injustice. Yeah, I was wondering how she found all this out. I found out what had happened when I showed up in town and saw a mob of people about to hang him. Everyone was laughing and telling the story to anyone who would listen actually thought that such injustice was funny. Even the bloody merchant was there for the hanging, and he was drinking from the sacred chalice. Yeah, I guess to Lily that sounds like a zen. Yes, so I've discovered. They already had the rope around the halfling's neck when I heard the whole story. I didn't know what to do, but I had to stop it. I ran forward into the crowd, yelling for them to stop, but I tripped and I fell in the mud. I looked up and saw the face of a kindly grandmother. I reached for her hand, and she kicked me right in the teeth. <laughs> Guess, oh, that sounds horrible. The mob turned into a giant brawl with fists and laughter flying everywhere. I crawled out of the crowd and fled town, weeping as I ran. I made it to the forest and collapsed in the bushes off the road. As I lay there weeping, I heard a twig snap. I spun around and standing there behind me was the halfling. He winked at me and toasted me with the chalice, which he held in his hand. I cried out that I had to have it back, but he just laughed and disappeared into the wood. I never saw him again. Alright. Really not being given an opportunity. <laughs> Even a pause and breath to bring up that she might have this chalice. Thank you, sweet Lily. That is a kind answer from a good friend. I know I shall probably never find the chalice again, but I shall not give up. I must return it to my people to restore my honor. Or right, finally, 
here, although they be given an opportunity to show Lanou what she found at the Melvin Estate. This silver chalice of Moombo. Thank you, Lily. I can never repay you for this gift of true friendship. Of course, she probably would have sold it, but <laughs> nobody offered her even a coin for it. There is something I have that might be of some use to you. This is the Pendant of the Elf. It has the power to enhance some of your abilities with those of the Elven ancestors. You've proven this day that you are a true friend to the Elven people. This pendant only works for those who prove such worthiness. I'm proud to be able to call you my friend, Lily. Alright, thank you, Lenu. Because of you, Lily, I can return the chalice to where it belongs. I shall protect it with my life until the opportunity arises for me to visit Avareska. Until that time, I shall remain by your side and help you achieve your goals. Thank you again, my dear friend. Lily doesn't mind parting with cheap trinkets of the Divine, especially seeing how happy it made her Dusty Diviner. And she's not surprised to hear the events from Lork. Even Volo narrowly escaped the town with his life. And Lily appreciates the Pendant of the Elf. It was a touching gift from an elf and sister, though a bit unconventional. The first was created by the elven mage Leodon, who was frustrated with non-elven adventurers who couldn't keep up with him on his underground adventures. These pendants improve the reflexes and grant dark vision. He asks that they only be given to those who have proved to themselves to be true friends of the elven people. Lily appreciates the sentiment, but even more so as a sign that she's gained Lenu's trust. Lily lays out her short bow and sprinkles ruby dust along the bow shaft, murmuring the incantations for her new spell. Her new arcane light affects the top an ordinary short bow. Now she can finally solve the piggish sorcerer's stick. Even Lanou's impressed and compliments her mistress, saying it adds a sparkle to her already beautiful emerald green eyes. Lily repays the compliment with a polite but coy smile. The ladies still laugh at the shining serpents embroidered on the warm, fluffy robes as they recline and talk about, well, nothing really. Lanou finds herself almost enchanted by Lily's eyes, complimenting her again on her still beautiful but now lavender eyes. In the morning, Lily apologizes to Lanou for having lit candles for a spell in the middle of the night, as she had forgotten to prepare Mel's acid arrow. Certainly more useful than continual flame. Unless, of course, they were hoping to employ the zombies of the beggar's nest as light bearers to illuminate the streets at night. Lanou jokingly responds that next they'll be teaching the zombies to drive the city coaches. Lily's careful not to slip in the puddle of serpent spit unsurprisingly still left from the night before. Lily was about to complain how the beggar's nest is in some kind of eternal night when her apprised astronomer presses her hand and informs her with a smile that it's the summer solstice. The irony, the longest day of the year under eternal night. Lily much prefers the winter solstice anyway, as it coincides with her birthday. Fittingly, the longest night of the year. Hello to you. Our trading with the Temple of Hal. Lenu seems very interested in Lily's birthday. She comes near her mistress and whispers in her ears as not to be heard by the Helmite. She asks 
if she believes in the oldest science, astrology. <laughs> Lily's eyebrows raise and then slowly settle as a subtle smile crawls across her face. Her dusty diviner is a mystic, it would seem. Although Lily doesn't put any stock in what others call the first folly, she nods without saying a word, unable to resist seeing where this might lead. Her naughty mystic exhales a sigh of relief before continuing to ask permission to draw detailed charts for her mistress that take into account not only the wheel of stars, but other heavenly bodies as well for a more accurate reading. Lily agrees, sort of. She first wants to hear what's involved, exactly what her mystic intends to do. Lily is certainly not going to reveal her true age lightly, if at all.